In life, we are all searching. Let me ask you a question. What is it that you see while you are searching? Now, if we're truly honest, what we're seeking might depend upon the day, or maybe even the moment. Because maybe we're hungry, so we're seeking food. If so, what, what, what kind of food are you hungry for? You got a taste for something specific? Are, are you thirsty? Are you seeking water? Are you tired? Are you, you seeking a comfortable bed, a, a pillow, and a blanket? Do you seek a job? Do you seek retirement? But are you seeking for peace? What are you searching for? But when we are searching, no matter what it is, it is a good thing to have faith. If we do not have faith that we will find what we are searching for, really, what's the point of searching? To look around for something and to think, oh, I'm, I'm never going to find this. Well, what's the point? It just seems like if you're doing that, you're wasting your time. But if we have faith while we are searching, we search with purpose. If we do not have search, excuse me, if we do not have faith, maybe what we should be searching for is that faith, and maybe even we need to be searching for our purpose. In the new year, we always seem to search for a reason to have hope. That this year will be better than the last year. The problem when we search, though, is that we still have that doubt. There's always that little bit of doubt that we will find good. Doubt that this coming year will be better than the last one. Hope, faith. We don't go looking for the bad, but we kind of expect it. You know, when we do this, and we do do this, we're placing limits on God. We forget at times how just how big our God is. We forget that all things are possible through Him, but yet we still put that limit on God. By ourselves, we have limits. But with Him, there are no limitations. And He does. God does have a plan for us. And it is not to harm us. It is not for these bad things to happen to us. It is for us to prosper. For us to be closer to Him, for us to be in a strong relationship. So seek what is good, but expect what is great. Now, in our scripture this morning, which is Matthew 2 1 through 12, we read the story of the wise men searching for a new king. They're searching for Jesus. We know this story. It's kind of a continuation of our Christmas story. But in this case, we know they've been searching for a very long time. They weren't there that night that Jesus was born and played in the manger. Biblical scholars estimate the wise men searched for two years, so when they finally found Jesus, he would have been a two-year-old, a toddler. Two years following a star, searching for something they know will be special. A king. Now we wonder when and where they all met. We believe there are three because of the three gifts. But that may not be the case. There could have been more. We don't know if they all came from the same place. Did they run into each other in that two-year time and 
find out they're looking, searching for the same thing, and then join together to do so. We also don't know if during the search, if there were more that got discouraged and turned and went home. But they must have known, they did know that they were searching for something big, really big. A king, yes, they knew this, but just not any king, because why would you have gone home after two years? It was just for a normal, everyday king. When we are searching for something in life, something big, there always seems to be a problem. Something or someone who gets in our way. We have people who tell us what we're searching for well, it's, it's not possible. They say to us, why well, waste your time on that? You shouldn't bother to do that. That will never happen. They, they try to put that doubt in you. I wonder if the, the wise men heard that stuff while they searched. In the case of the wise men, we do know one person who got in their way. Of course, when we look at the scripture, that is obviously here. I always pictured the wise men entering the area and being desperate at that time and almost, dare I say, frustrated, asking everyone, where is the king? Looking at scripture, news of this got back to Herod. We always run into people who are self-centered, who are defeated themselves in life, and are, of course, looking out for their own self-interest. Herod was paranoid. Herod wanted to remain in power. The thought of another king just terrified him. Someone like Herod could easily discourage someone who is seeking what is great. The wise men spoke to him and they, they did not trust Herod. They knew what Herod was up to. So they kind of went around him. We see that in the scripture as well. But they did not allow Herod to stop their search in any way. We have established and we know that the wise men knew they were searching for something big. You have to wonder, how big? Again, were they searching for something good, but not expecting great? Obviously, they thought this would be a new king, but did they think it would be a king of this world? One like they have already seen before. A king that would be able to rule like all the kings before. A king that would maybe though end the reign of terror known as the Roman Empire. Oh, they were expecting great things. That's why they, they bought the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts fit for a king. But did they know they were searching for something greater than a king? Savior. A Savior. One whose reign will last forever, never end. One who would teach the world about love. One who, instead of defeating their enemies with a strong army, would pray for them, would love on them. One that would be not served but practice and teach the idea that we call servant ministry. One that would die for his people whom he loved, and of course, rise again 
in three days, defeating death. They were looking for something good. They were searching for that good. Did they expect to find greatness? Did they expect to find one who loves us so much that they would go through everything that Jesus went through and have this desire, this overwhelmingly strong desire to bring us up with him to a place where we will be in his glory for all eternity. I do believe, I think we should excuse the wise men for maybe not understanding these things. But yeah, we need to give them credit. They sacrificed. They did not give up searching. And their search, in the end, paid off. ask you all a question. A question I can answer to yourselves, of course. But be honest with yourself. After all, you got to know if you're lying to yourself. In the next year, what are you seeking? I can open that way, too. I'm bringing that question back. What are you searching for? And I'm not just talking about the traditional New Year's resolutions that we start at January 1st and they're in trouble by January 2nd, if not by the evening of January 1st. You'll lose weight. You'll get in shape. You'll pay off the debt. Get that promotion. Head towards that retirement. I'm talking about what are you searching for in your spiritual life? What do you seek? Do you seek to gain more biblical knowledge? Do you want to read the Bible more? Do you seek to better your prayer life? Do you want to pray so many times a day? Do you want to learn how to forgive that one who at one time really hurt you? Do you want to have a closer relationship with God? You know, these things possible. For God wants you to seek is to strive for these things. And his grace is with us every day. It's available every day to help us out in these things. We just need to keep searching, to keep working in. These things are possible through God. Now there is there's always one thing standing in our way. And of course, we can make excuses and argue that there's a Herod standing in our way. And I will admit we all know that they're out there. But we should see them as just little speed bumps, little inconveniences in our lives. Because really, with God on our side, we should not be stopped. So really, the only thing that is getting in your way of searching, of seeking and finding greatness, is you. It's you. That's it. Only you can stop searching. Only you can decide, I, I don't want to seek that anymore. But I encourage you not to do that. And I remind you that you are, each and every one of you, a beloved child of God. An all-powerful God with no limitations. For when we seek, we're with Him. When we seek, we will find. When we knock at the door, it will be answered. And we should not be surprised when we knock and there's an answer. It's kind of like calling somebody on the phone and being caught off guard when they answer, when we just, oh, we're just going to get the answering machine. We need to be ready for something great. When we seek God, when we seek godly things, expect big things. When we pray, expect an answer. 
this coming year, this year that we just started. Be seeking to get closer. Do not put limitations on God. Expect an amazing year. Be wise and continue seeking. Continue searching. Continue on your journey, walking and getting closer to our Lord. Amen. Good morning. It's great to see you here today and joining us online. Today's scripture is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Surely, for this reason, I, Paul the prisoner, of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and the prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace, given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, and the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm, according to his eternal promise, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is the word of God, written for you, the people of God. My name is Pastor Betsy Bowen, and I'm with the Upper River Ministries. I'm just so very happy to be able to present this word to you today. Albert Schweitzer once said that happiness is nothing more than good health and a bad memory. Schweitzer was a pretty smart guy, and I think I understand where he's coming from, but still I'm not so sure. I think a good memory is a pretty important thing to have, when we use it the right way. Much of our lives are spent looking in the rear view mirror. It's only when we look back that we can really see those significant events that have shaped who we are and turned us in the direction that we're going. This first Sunday of the New Year is a good time for looking forward. New Year's resolutions, res resolutions and all that going to get into better shape, going to finally get organized, that kind of stuff. You see, it does little good to resolve to get in better shape if we don't think about our past behavior and what caused us to get into su such bad shape to start with. Proper nutrition is a mindset, it's not a diet. Does it do any good for us to exercise and get in shape if we don't adjust the busy schedule or the change in attitude that resulted in our shape now. Sure, getting more organized is great, and I would really love to do that personally, but what caused us to get so out of being organized to start with? Maybe our lives in general need to be more organized. It's true, though, isn't it? Thinking about the past can help shape or reshape our future. 
It's possible that Schweitzer at least got it partially right. When we consider where we have been, we truly know where we are going. And we can adjust things so as not to keep repeating all of our old habits. It takes a pretty good memory to be able to do that. It is good to look back on the past and learn from it. That is what Paul is doing in his letter to the Ephesians Christians. In order to navigate the present situation, he's looking to the past, the events that have gotten into this place in their journey in the first place. Paul is in prison, and that's the place that gives him a lot of time and opportunity to do writing. It certainly seems like Paul spent a lot of time in prison, didn't it? Actually, most of his writing was done behind bars. When he wasn't in prison, he was too busy doing his ministry to write. Think about it. If Paul hadn't gotten into so much trouble, what, of course, which is, of course, what made him a consistent jailbird, we may not have his writing. And we all would be poorer for that. It's true that some people wish Paul hadn't said certain things. But if it weren't for Paul and his writing, and for Paul getting into trouble, our New Testament would be limited to the Gospels and a few other small epistles, plus John's Revelation. But then again, John wrote his Revelation as he was exiled on the island of Patmos. The early Christians certainly got into a lot of trouble. Most of the New Testament was written by people on the run or in jail. In the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing to a group of people who are themselves in trouble. <coughs> it hasn't landed them in jail, and they don't have a price on their head, but it has put their faith and their church in jeopardy. What's the problem? Well, for one thing, their morality has become suspect, and they, as Gentile Christians, proudly pronounce themselves independent of any Jewish influence. In fact, they have become rather intolerant of the Jewish Christians in their churches. Having received the gospel as a gift, they are now denying the value of that gift to others who are different, who are different from them. They're like children who have received new gifts at Christmas and refuse to share them with others. Sadly, that is a behavior that the church has been continuing ever since. How does Paul set them straight? By doing what Paul always does when he finds himself explaining what he considers to be God's eternal plan of salvation for human creation. He uses himself and his relationship with Jesus as an example. Let's make sure we've got this right now. Here is a guy who at first persecuted by persecuted the followers of Jesus. Jesus, the risen Lord, goes to all the trouble to confront him on the road to Damascus. He turned his life completely around and gave him the authority of being a leader and sharing the gospel to the Gentiles. During Paul's ministry, he spent a lot of time defending his position as an apostle. I think that was really, really important to him. Now, he's sharing in this scripture, he's sharing himself as the very least of all the saints. Let's listen to what he says in Ephesians 3, 8. This grace was given to me by the Gentiles, the news of the boundless riches of Christ, and to bring light to what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. But, and we knew there'd be a but there, while Paul is talking about himself, he has something else in mind. He's giving his own personal testimony in the context of the church. By the time Paul corresponds with the Christians in Ephesus, 
he had come to the full and certain understanding that the church was the one institution that Jesus loved the most. Not the temple, not the law, the church. And if Christ would live to begin the church and to die to redeem the church, then Paul could at least give his life to the church and die for it if he had to. Which, the more time he spends in jail, looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. Let's look at this in the context of who we are and where we are as we enter into this new year. Here we are. It's 2022. 2021 is past. A lot of chaos. A lot of different things. But let's move on. Let's get over it and get on with it. I once saw a bumper sticker that says, Life is what happens when you've made other plans. The calendar happens to us, and 2021 is gone, and a new year has begun. Imagine that you are moving along, filling out your days with what you think is really important. You've made plans, you've set a goal, you have a purpose in everything that you do. And suddenly there's a collision. Except this time, it isn't a car, or a total stranger, or even a friend. Your collision is with God. That's what happened to Paul. So maybe that is why, when he talked about eternal things, he talked about himself a lot. Of this gospel, Paul says, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. He thinks, there comes a point in our life we have to decide that we are not at the mercy of other forces that do not and cannot claim divinity. We say, this is what I want to do. This is what this is who I will be. It has less to do with the circumstances of what's happened to us than it does with the path we choose to travel. <coughs> and the appropriate path is the one that takes us in God's direction. In today's scripture, Paul's telling the Ephesians, This is the life I have chosen. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. This is the life I have chosen. Despite the circumstances that have brought me here, I have chosen to do what I am doing, to be what and who I am. I rejoice in what God has done through me and look forward to what is yet to come. There comes a time for each of us when we have to say, this is the life I choose. This is the direction I will take. And if God is in it, and God will be in it by your invitation, then it is not only the life we've decided upon, but the life God has given to us as a precious gift. As we move forward into this new year, let us begin by sharing our love, and our care for one another. Let us pray. Lord, we're just so very thankful for your love and your grace. We're thankful for Paul's writing. We're thankful for the impact you had upon his life when you met him on the road to Damascus. Lord, we ask you to come into our lives and see where there needs to be a change. Help us to choose to live our lives, but help us to choose you to guide us through it. And all of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture is from the second chapter of Matthew, beginning at the first verse. This is a Bible event that we're all familiar with. Visitors from the East. First verse. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About the same time, wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is 
the newborn king of the Jews. We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as, every, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Jerusalem, in Judea, they said, For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time that the star first appeared. When he told them, Go to Bethlehem, and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I may go worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return. That is a interesting uh, aspect of the gospel. A little bit of everything in there. Some international intrigue, some kind of uh, various um, plots and subplots of various descriptions. Uh, the wise men coming. All of us, or just about all of us, many of us, have these handy devices in our pockets. And one thing that they can do is they can get maps for us. They can um, give us directions. They uh, are kind of connected via satellite. And they have what's known as GPS. And... Um, uh, it helps people get around. It helps us, uh, Lynn and I, quite a bit. And um, that's something that uh, is always uh, handy to have on a trip, just about of any kind. It'll help you find a restaurant. It'll help you find a place where you're going. It'll help you find anything. But we're going to talk about the ultimate GPS. The GPS that is... Uh, far out into the heavens and exceeds all other GPS has ever invented. And not only that, but it was almost 20 centuries ago. Uh, that star in Bethlehem that guided the wise men, the uh, star that uh, set up over that city, was the ultimate GPS. That was God's GPS. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the wise men and their GPS star. What did the star do? What exactly did the star do? 
It located Jesus in a house. It came to rest over his location. It led the wise men to Bethlehem. And though they stopped in Jerusalem and got a little bit of help, a little bit of fine-tuning uh, in their direction, in their search, a little bit of background information, it was still the star, ultimately, that led them to the city of David, Bethlehem. And they arrived in Jerusalem and in Bethlehem, knowing who that star belonged to. That star was designated for the one that would be the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And somehow, whether they felt it in their hearts, or whether they just consulted with each other and developed the understanding but they knew that star uh, heralded the birth of the Messiah. They went to Jerusalem and they went to Bethlehem knowing who they were looking for. The star was in the heavens, visible to the wise men. And it also was visible to the rest of the world to all the rest of the world beyond Judaism. Through it, God embraced the whole world and invited everyone to his son, invited everyone to see his son, invited everyone to Bethlehem. It's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing. The Star of Bethlehem, in addition to being the ultimate GPS, it was the ultimate birth announcement. It was an amazing birth announcement. I remember this past summer, Lynn and I had the opportunity to go to Brooklyn, New York City, and meet our grandson for the first time. Oh, we had seen his pictures, we had seen him on FaceTime, we had seen some little motion pictures of him, and uh, we had seen Nick's play, all of the photographs that um, you can just imagine. But when we got to walk in that apartment and see him in person, nothing else was significant. Nothing else was as important. Nothing else made a difference. It was seeing Jack live and in person. We did bring some gifts. Of course we did. We were grandparents. We were glad to bring gifts. And, um, but yet, it seems like these wise men, they took it all a step further because they came into the house and by this time a few years had gone by, they really saw toddler Jesus and Mary. Apparently Joseph wasn't there at that particular occasion or it's just not written about by Matthew, we don't know. But this we do know. The wise men brought gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wise men bowed down and worshipped. They absolutely were convinced that this one was the Messiah, that this one would make a difference in the world. And whether or not they knew it, whether or not these wise men understood they met an important need of Jesus' family because just in a very few days, apparently, 
after they receive this gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the holy family was going to have to beat a path out of, out of uh, Bethlehem because it appeared that Herod and his henchmen were going to come and visit, and that visit would not go good for anybody. So the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which obviously were all had monetary value attached to them, especially the gold, but the frankincense and myrrh too, uh, financed the trip to Egypt, financed the years of living in Egypt. I doubt if Jesus ever saw any of that, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And for that matter, um, I don't think much of it probably made it back to Nazareth after the sojourn in Egypt. But this star was Christ's star. It did reach everywhere, across borders, across ethnicities, across language barriers. It reached all, and um, it reached through all of the ways that humankind divides itself. There is no getting out from underneath this star. It shines everywhere. Now, it's easy to ask at this point, where did it come from? How did this happen? What put this star together? What made it? What, what put it in the heavens? Is it real? Those are all natural questions. And we know from some indications in Scripture that um, God had a way with life within Himself. It was in the Genesis creation, where God creates the heavens and the earth. There was a void. There was darkness. There was chaos. And God put in order. He put in heaven. He put in earth. And then, God made light. God called for light. And there was light. And I think God's own presence, <coughs> the Holy Spirit's own presence, made a um, illumination even before the sun was made, even before God made the sun. So if God could illuminate the universe, illuminate the created order of the earth, even before the creation of the sun, God would have no trouble casting a star in the heavens to shine upon Bethlehem. Some years ago, President Jimmy Carter was asked about the virgin birth. Uh, some, probably some newspaper man at a White House press conference wanted to trap him on something or, uh, you know, how it is with interviews such as that, uh, they, you know, they always trip you up on some kind of question and watch you, watch you squirm under their question. But President Carter, when asked about the virgin birth, made an uh, interesting point. He said, it's not a matter of biology, the virgin birth, it's a matter of faith. And I think that's ultimately what we can say about the star of Bethlehem. This is not a matter of astronomy. This is not a matter of something you take a telescope and um, discover. This is a matter of faith. And the Bethlehem star, you need to see it in your heart. 
before you'll ever see it in the sky. And it made a difference. It made all the difference. It told the whole world they were invited to the side of Jesus. It told the whole world that there was a birth of the Messiah at Bethlehem. It guided the wise men directly to Bethlehem, to the very house that Jesus was in. They opened up their gifts, and, it, and if a matter of speaking is, the star called these gifts together for the Holy Family, for their sojourn in Egypt. A lot of different aspects are at play here. And a lot of things are working together to save Jesus' life when he was most vulnerable in the human condition. The star of Bethlehem guided the ones that saved the Savior. That's important. That's important for us to see. Important for us to know and to understand. Mary, we talked about last week, treasured some aspects of Jesus' life in her heart. We said that. We said that it was in the scripture. It was in our uh, passage that we read last week of Jesus' staying in Jerusalem a few extra days and hobnobbing and talking with wise and learned men to be as well. And it said at the end that Mary treasured this in her heart. I think another thing that Mary probably treasured in her heart, and we can treasure in our hearts too, is the star of Bethlehem. It is a treasure. It's a treasure for us all. It's called us to a Savior. And it led uh, the wise men there. It led gifts there. It led 